ございAnd welcome to Aliens and Moonbeams, a podcast about being foreign in Japan and other places too. It's fall. And as of last month, I've officially been living in Japan for three years. And I think as each year goes by, maybe even as each day goes by, I think about my life here differently. As other expats will tell you, living in a foreign country can make you highly aware of your foreignness and expedite several life-altering, and sometimes incredibly awkward, but ultimately amazing adventures. My goal for this podcast is to share and document those stories, and bring to light the awkwardness, the seriousness, and everything in betweenness of what it means to be foreign. Being an alien can be a human thing too. To start us off, I'll tell you a small story about my phone. So let's call this episode Frankie, the phone that died. Frankie was home to over 3,000 photos, notes, and other treasures, of which until last summer I thought were forever mine. This included various photos that I would have been featured in a zine that I'm making, and pictures and videos that I took of my mom when she visited me here in Japan. It was her first time to leave the States, or, as she has later informed me, her first time to leave North America. It wasn't until the end of Frankie, the phone, that I realized that Frankie, the phone, hadn't been properly backed up. I remember standing in the Apple store, anxiously waiting to see if Frankie could be revived or at least the photos brought back, when I was finally approached by the bilingual employee who was helping me with this minor tragedy. In so many words, she basically said, your stuff is gone forever. Unfortunately, even when translating English to English, the meaning doesn't really change. So your stuff is gone forever still means your stuff is gone forever. For all the times I wish things were not lost in translation, this time I wished otherwise. Our modern relationships to our phones are no secret. They can be our natural counterparts. Wherever we go, they go. We are accessible, and the worlds outside our own can be within our reach. That is, until your phone dies. But I'm not one to usually despair about this kind of disconnection not one to rely so heavily on a device until it's broken. I grew up in a place where I found solace in the silence of snowy mountains, where I ran into lakes, submerging myself underwater so I didn't have to hear the sounds of distant cars going by. Even so, I have to admit that Frankie, my phone that died, was my connection to the people in those places. One of the worst parts of losing Frankie for me was feeling pretty stupid about losing precious photos, especially ones that connected me to my mom, who was now at home, thousands of miles away, and not very good at FaceTime. Hello? Hey, Bear. (laughs) How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hello? Mom? Hello? Mom, can you hear me? However, 
There was another aspect to saying goodbye and replacing this phone that was a shade more difficult than the norm. I was living abroad. I was living in Japan. In Japan, your phone is a kind of key to the universe. Not really. <laughs> but in my experience, I needed a phone number in order to open a bank account, and a bank account in order to get a phone number, which might have been as complicated as it sounds if it weren't for the help I received from my coworkers at the time. Big shout out to Chicago and Grace. Thank you. <laughs> when you finally get your phone set up, you find it becomes a kind of necessary companion, your lifeline your dictionary, often your literal means of identity and communication within the world you're in, and the worlds outside of it. It's your new best friend. At least, that's how it was for me. Ellie! Hi! Hi! I'm back! <laughs> you're back! <laughs> This is Ellie. She's a friend I made while living here in Sendai. You know, I've still got all my Japan stuff in boxes, so slowly taking it out because, you know, moving new house and getting new furniture, yeah. all that kind of thing. Ellie recently moved back home to Australia. She lived in Japan for two years, and before that had spent a year abroad in Japan during university. She tells me that her connection to Japan is strong, but... We also talk about her transition back home. Like, I miss Japan and I miss the people there, but at the same time, it's so easy being back home. Weird because there's so many things that I want to say that I can't because people just won't understand or they're just not interested. I'm constantly comparing things to Japan. I have to stop myself from saying it out loud because I don't want to be a weirdo. <laughs> in Japan this happens or when I was in Japan because it was such a big part of my life right people don't actually care <laughs> because they know they don't that's not the person like they know you as Ellie tells me that since she's come home she hasn't had time to process all the changes she hasn't even looked at the goodbye DVD that her students made her I have literally thrown myself into life here because I didn't want to deal with, you know, those feelings of being empty and missing Japan. So I, went, I got back to Australia on the 28th of July and I started my university course on the 2nd of August. <laughs> so oh, man. I, really, I really didn't waste any time. You know, I just wanted to keep, keep going. I didn't want to stop because... If I stopped, I knew I'd be sad. In light of Frankie's recent passing, I ask Ellie about the relationship between her and her own phone. You've become so attached to your phones, though, when you're in Japan. <laughs> yeah. It's your connection to your world that isn't in Japan. It links you to everyone, and it's kind of like a safe place. How can I say that? Like... <laughs> <laughs> You can kind of escape in it. <laughs> like I can just listen to an English podcast or I can just talk to my mom on the phone while I'm walking down the street. Like those things would just made you made me so happy. Like, you know, I didn't really think about that kind of thing when I was in Australia, but being in Japan and being able to be connected to people from back home was just, it's just so different. You just, you just think about it differently. Um, so now that you're back in Australia and yeah. you have your iPhone 5C from Japan <laughs> and, and you're no longer using it, like, do you have any feelings about that phone? <laughs> well, it is just sitting in my drawer um, with its cute sushi case. 
Oh, it has a sushi case? Yeah. Toki Sude ni o sushi. Oh. So, <laughs> um, but I haven't really thought about it. I've, I look at it and I get angry. <laughs> but that's about it because I just get angry because I have an iPhone 5 that I literally cannot use. Um, I was talking to my friend Mandy. She's back in Australia as well. She was in Japan for two years. And she was telling me how she now uses hers as an iPod when she goes for runs. So, like, just basically an expensive paperweight for me now. I feel like there needs to be a museum for, like, leftover <laughs> Japan phones. <laughs> that would be so good. Finally, I asked Ellie if she had any last words for Frankie, my phone that died. Frankie, you serve Jess so well. I, I just remember all the things that Jess did with Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> and all the amazing photos that were taken, all the memories that were on there. But, you know, they're in, they're in iPhone photo heaven, so. They truly are. And they're in your head as well. I'm sure that you still remember things. Doing regular life small adult things can sometimes be made 10 bajillion times harder if you're living in a foreign country. Replacing a phone, one as memorable as Frankie, can take lots of energy, time, and patience. I remember when Frankie 2 arrived, I went to the phone store for the pickup. Replacing the key to your universe is no easy feat. So the appointment took over two hours. I got the impression the salesperson had a lot she was required to say to me in mandatory polite Japanese. Unfortunately for both of us, I understood about 50% of it. We went through lots of paperwork, and finally, Frankie too was mine to keep. The salesperson thanked me, and I thanked her. I stood up to leave, when suddenly there was a kind of panic. Her eyes widened, and she gestured quickly for me to sit down again. There was a lot of bustling, and a couple of other salespeople were whispering in her ears. She was nodding profusely. There was something she had apparently forgotten to tell me. Flustered, she handed me an envelope with bubble wrap casing inside. She pointed to the broken Frankie one, and again to the envelope. It became clear that I was going to have to send away the broken remains of my phone. So I asked in concise Japanese if I could keep Frankie, with the wild notion that someday, somebody would have the technology to salvage everything inside. I explained about the photos. But she shook her head vehemently and mimed to me that I had to choose. A broken phone that doesn't turn on or a new one that does. She even said in English, no, and made an X with her arms several times just in case I didn't understand. Some of her co-workers were giggling, clearly entertained by our efforts to communicate with each other that entire time. Their giggles turned to hushed voices every time I spoke, and she would look at them and sigh, commiserating her exhaustion. I remember hearing one of them say, Saikin gaikokujin ga desne which loosely translates to, there's been a lot of foreigners lately. I don't know why it happened exactly, but some hot tears sprung up in the corners of my eyes. I said all the proper thank yous before leaving the store and left before I had to see more stares or sly glances. I guess it probably had something to do with resigning to officially say goodbye to Frankie. It was silly, but I also think it had to do with that feeling of helplessness that came from the room where the transaction was taking place. As helpful as the staff were trying to be, they couldn't hide their discomfort of communicating with me. I was reminded, as we are often meant to expect, of that feeling of not quite belonging, of being something that doesn't quite fit. Beam me up, folks, was all that I could think at the time. The accompanying thought was that when I got home, I was going to open up my Japanese textbooks, and my studying regime was about to get a lot stricter. A few days later, I picked Frankie up and slipped her inside the soft packaging. 
I walked to the post office and sent her away. Not really sure where she was off to, because I had been afraid to ask. And I was afraid I wouldn't completely understand the answer if I had. <laughs> Next time on Aliens and Moonbeams, hear first-hand stories about why some foreigners are living abroad. What were they looking for? What did they find? This episode was in memory of Frankie, the phone that died. Frankie, I'm sorry I dropped you. Frankie too? I promise I'll try to be more careful. Aliens and Moonbeams would like to thank you for listening to the first episode ever. Thanks for taking part. Today you heard the guest voices of Ellie McEwen and Kim Khaled, and I'm your host Jess. Thank you from the very bottom of our moonbeams. <laughs>